Uh, Tatsalak, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to start, uh, unfortunately, with a few introductory remarks. It's going to take a few minutes out of my time, but I think it'll be time well spent. Um, I first want to make it really clear, um, just as a matter of process, that I do not speak on behalf of the Nez Perce tribe, um, nor am I a member of the Nez Perce tribe. I'm an employee, and so I'll be presenting today the tribe's perspective on uh, wolf recovery from that standpoint. Uh, but the tribe has an, ele an elected executive committee and the chairman who officially speaks on behalf of the tribe, and I just want to make that clear. Um, it's also important to understand that um, the Nez Perce tribe, like many tribes, is a diverse community. Um, it's a microcosm in many ways of the general public. And so, in general, most tribal members were and are uh, very supportive of wolf recovery. Um, there are some tribal members, at least, who are very much anti-wolf for some of the same reasons that some non-tribal members are anti-wolf. Uh, it's just a diverse community. Um, and similarly, Indian country itself is very diverse, and I, I can't overemphasize this point enough. Um, every tribe has its own history, its own culture, its own um, practices, and its own perspectives on natural resource issues, including the restoration of wolves. So some tribes, like the Nez Perce tribe, um, have been very supportive of wolf recovery. Some tribes are on record as opposing wolf recovery. Indian country is just a diverse place, and every tribe has its own perspective on these things. And of course, the same can all be said for the states. So even um, within a state, you have, of course, state legislatures, you have state commissions, you have uh, departments of fish and wildlife. Often those entities, even within a state, aren't in perfect alignment. And of course, as you go state by state, each state has its own perspective on wolf recovery. And so there's still a tremendous amount of diversity out there. So the question is, is wolf reintroduction right for Colorado? And I certainly am not in a position to answer that question for anyone here. I'm not even sure I'd feel comfortable answering this question, even in hindsight, for the state of Idaho. But I can tell you that wolf re recovery was right for the Nez Perce tribe. And so I would encourage all of you who are interested in hearing a tribal perspective on uh, wolf recovery in what is now Colorado to seek out the tribes of what is now Colorado. I'm not going to highlight any particular tribe um, out of respect for the complex history of a lot of these areas. Um, but I think some of you can think of some of them, and I encourage you all to seek those tribes out if you're interested in hearing their perspective. So I've been invited to share with you all today the Nez Perce's experience with and uh, perspective on wolf recovery in what is now Idaho. And through a, a, a sequence of events that I'm going to summarize here in a moment, the Nez Perce tribe found itself um, leading the wolf recovery effort in Idaho for over a decade, beginning in 1995. Um, and for us, wolf recovery was a homecoming. So the gray wolf, or himen in the Nez Perce language, which is Nimi Putimki, um, those animals were common in the tribe's homeland for thousands of years, of course, um, before being actively eliminated, mainly for um, ranching, to support ranching interests um, in the, by the mid-1900s. Um, I've referenced wolf recovery and cultural restoration in the title of this talk. But in fact, from the tribe's standpoint, um, wolf recovery was and is intended as an action for cultural restoration. And this perspective of cultural restoration through the recovery of important uh, species is a theme that you see repeated on for a number of other species that are uh, rare or even extirpated from the tribe's homeland at this point in time, including species like grizzly bear, um, California condor, sandhill crane, Columbia sharp-tailed grouse, and perhaps most notably for the Nez Perce, anadromous fish species like Pacific lamprey and Chinook coho and sockeye salmon. So wolves are culturally important to the Nez Perce for a number of reasons. Uh, first and foremost, they have very particular religious and spiritual significance. Uh, many tribal members feel a close personal affinity to wolves. They identify with them very strongly. Um, and in many cases, particularly historically, many tribal members would um, um, adopt the word for wolf into their own name in order to, to capture that relationship. Um, some Nez Perce have um, identified similarities between Nez Perce culture and the culture and the, the life history of wolves in that they range over large areas, um, they support each other, and they have very strong uh, family bonds. Some Nez Perce have pointed to similar treatment for the Nez Perce and for wolves uh, during Euro-American settlement of their homeland, um, particularly as it relates to settlement and economic activity. Um, some tribal members also point to um, wolf, the eradication of wolves from our homeland as deeply wrong from a, from a religious or a spiritual or a philosophical or even a moral standpoint. 
Um, and so wolf recovery was an opportunity for um, the tribe to, to right that wrong, or for the population at large to right that wrong. And then finally, um, as with so many things in Indian country, wolf recovery provided an opportunity for um, the tribe to exercise its sovereignty in a way, to help shape its future in a way that for the Nez Perce and many other tribes are just not simply able to do um, and haven't been for several hundred years now. Uh, but of course, in Idaho, that uh, attitude wasn't universally shared. Um, if you look closely, this is not a bounty poster for wolves. This is offering $5,000 for um, the arrest or the detention of people involved in wolf recovery in the early 90s. Um, it goes on to say that um, the killing of wolves in Idaho is encouraged, it's spelled incorrectly, and then it says, um, shoot, shovel, and shut up, which you hear, which we all heard before. Um, I would like to comment on that phrase from a tribal perspective. It relates to another phrase you hear commonly, which is, uh, the only good wolf is a dead wolf. Um, it's not lost on some in tribal communities that um, those phrases are, are very similar and echo another sentiment that was expressed in tribal communities for decades, particularly in the late 1800s, which is that the only good Indian is a dead Indian. So this sort of rhetoric that you see, which is sometimes more of a tongue in cheek, kind of a screw you sort of an attitude when it's applied to wolves, um, it can really have racial undertones that, that may not always be intended, um, but it, that attitude is heard in communities where wolf recovery is really viewed as an expression of cultural renewal for that particular group of people. So as many of you are aware, wolves are by most definitions recovered in Idaho. Um, but as many of you are aware against that backdrop, there was a tremendous amount of activities and Suzanne summarized quite a bit of that. I'm gonna sur um, summarize it a bit more. Oh, here's another photo of um, a tribal blessing ceremony for some of the wolves being brought into Idaho at that time. Um, but I've attempted to summarize in one slide um, a very brief history of the tribe's involvement with wolf recovery in Idaho. Um, so bear with me, this is gonna be quick. Um, in the lead up to uh, the recovery effort, this is in the late 80s, early 90s, the, the tribe um, voiced its support for the recovery of wolves in our homeland, uh, and also our, our interest in partnering in a full way with the Fish and Wildlife Service in that effort. Um, support for wolves in Idaho was actually not too bad in Idaho, in Idaho at that time, but there were some key constituencies that were opposed to it at that time, and certainly within the state legislature there was some opposition. So this really put this Idaho state legislature in a real bind. So they wanted, to, they wanted the state to participate in the recovery effort to help, to help shape the eventual proposal. But they also wanted to position themselves so that they, couldn't, it, they weren't in a position to have facilitated an outcome that they were not supportive of and that some in their political base were very much against. So they did this through a variety of ways. And one of them was to put Idaho Department of Fish and Game on a very short leash. Um, this is the tribe's perspective on this. This is not the state's uh, description of its own events. Um, and they did, they put an Idaho fishing game on a short leash by micromanaging the authorities that the department had to at times work and at other times not work with the Fish and Wildlife Service. And that flip-flopped several times over uh, a several year period. Now, the Fish and Wildlife Service in its 1994 record of decision authorizing wolf reintroduction in uh, central Idaho and in Yellowstone made it very clear that both states and tribes could participate in the recovery effort in partnership with the service if they had suitable wolf management plans in place. Um, but in 1995, in January of 1995, the Idaho legislature rejected the state's own draft wolf recovery plan one week after wolf reintroduction had already begun in the state. And with that action, under the terms of the 94 rod, the state of Idaho could not lead on the ground recovery efforts in its own state. And so what was anticipated to be a participatory role for the Nez Perce tribe um, overnight became a leadership role. Uh, the tribe stepped forward at that point with our own recovery plan, um, which looked suspiciously similar to the state's <laughs> recovery plan <laughs> with some of the sharper edges filed off, um, which the service accepted. Um, the tribe went, to make a long story short, the tribe went on to lead the recovery effort in Idaho on the ground for over a decade, up until 2006. Our relationship with the service actually just ended here at the end of 2016, and that was through the, the post-delisting monitoring phase that the tribe was also involved in. So Idaho, in hindsight, the Idaho legislature effectively sidelined the state of Idaho for over a decade. So instead of participating in the wolf recovery effort, 
the state focused more on the transition of authorities um, from the service to the states, and that began around two, in the 2006 area the time frame, um, as well as, of course, the post-delisting period, which really only permanently started happening in 2011. There were some false starts there, but in 2011, that's what started it. Um, but that was 16 years after the wolf recovery effort had begun in Idaho. The support for wolves in Idaho, um, I haven't actually seen the numbers, but it doesn't seem, it doesn't feel like it's particularly improved. Um, and just as an example of that, in 2001, the Idaho House uh, passed a joint memorial stating, among other things, that uh, wolf recovery has no basis in common sense, legitimate science, or free enterprise economics, uh, that wolves are not a game animal, they're predators and should be managed as such, and that uh, wolves should be removed from the state by whatever means necessary. But keep in mind, this is in year six of the recovery effort. There were close to approaching 300 wolves in Idaho by this point in time. So it was quite an ask at that point. So in the time I have left, which is not very much, um, I'd like to share some lessons learned from the Nez Perce point of view. Um, I think it has to be said, um, although I certainly wouldn't recommend it to anyone in this room or elsewhere, um, that it's possible to recover wolves or other species even in the face of intense state opposition. Um, we've all heard the comment um, across many states, particularly the American West, um, that the states know best how to manage and conserve wildlife. Sometimes that's true, and it's often true on the basis purely of the amount of resources available to do that. But sometimes it's not in the Nez Perce view. Um, among other things, states generally have few or no obligations to American Indian tribes uh, that find themselves living within the border of those new states. Um, but the federal government has relationships with, and more importantly, in some cases, obligations to uh, many of these tribes, as well as the states. So when people think about the major players in wildlife conservation, I think it's natural we all think of the federal government, the states, and the NGO community which is broad and has been very successful in many areas. Um, but it's also important to remember that there are hundreds of tribes within the United States, and each one of those has a relationship with the wildlife of their homeland that really dates back millennia. And so if, if their vision and the vision of others can align and the goals align, those tribes can be really powerful partners in conservation efforts. Um, but I also want to point out in the same breath that tribes should not really be viewed as um, special interest groups or just another stakeholder in the process. Um, pretty often the Nespers tribe is lumped in with uh, groups like the local OHV club or the livestock growers or wilderness advocates. Um, those are, of course, special interests, and they're special interests for many tribal members. Um, but when a, when a tribal government um, establishes a position on a given issue, that has a, that has a different sort of standing um, than the same sort of position that might be uh, voiced by an advocacy group, for instance. Um, tribes, many tribes anyway, um, have a rather unique standing um, when it comes to federal decision-making processes. Um, and so I think in many cases, unfortunately in Idaho, I, it's um, been our experience that Idaho tends to misjudge its own supremacy on a lot of these issues. There's a, it's a multipolar decision space, and I don't think that's appreciated fully in, in some states. I, I have no idea if that applies to Colorado, but uh, that's been our experience in Idaho. Um, tribal perspectives can be very complex. Um, I appreciated Mike's comment late yesterday um, where he drew a distinction between, um, I guess it was recreational and sport hunting versus subsistence hunting. Um, if you think about it, the Nez Perce people are disproportionately rural, disproportionately vulnerable from a financial standpoint, um, and most of their hunting, not all, but most of their hunting is done for subsistence purposes. Um, by those measures alone, many of us might think that the Nez Perce tribe would have been more opposed to wolf recovery in Idaho than the ranching community in Idaho um, because of that vulnerability. But I think that uh, the Nez Perce tribe provides a good example that it's possible for people to live close to the land um, in a way that does not uh, seek to or take actions that uh, attempt to dominate it, I guess is what I would say. So there's a lesson there. But that, that's a complex relationship that I think is easy to, to overlook. Um, the state of Idaho, um, even before reintroduction began, um, it was really clear that they wanted wolves off of the endangered species list so that they could manage wolves like any other game species. You hear that pretty commonly across many states. 
Um, the problem is that, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, the problem, oh yeah, the problem is with treating wolves as any other game species is that most people, especially in like a state legislature arena, um, those legislators don't hate like mule deer or rough grouse, for instance, right? Game species are usually well liked. And there's a lot of, there's broad acceptance, I think, across the general public, certainly within the Nez Perce tribe, that the state is genuinely interested in um, conserving those species over the long term. That's not true with wolves. Um, some of that rhetoric that I mentioned earlier, the tribe hears that rhetoric pretty regularly, and I think it's really, it's really eroded our confidence that the state of Idaho can be trusted to conserve wolves over the long term in Idaho. It's much more of a case of avoiding a relisting than it is about a genuine interest in, in uh, conservation of that species. And I think um, just in general, you know, wildlife conservation is hard enough, it's challenging enough under the best of circumstances, I think it really becomes even more challenging if it's you're talking about a species that is not truly valued by a broad swath of the community. Um, excuse me, I encourage all of you to um, be champions for reality at all times. Um, Facts will get ignored, they'll get lost, and um, they will be replaced by alternative facts in some cases that fit a narrative that's more comforting to user groups. Um, this is a huge problem for us in Idaho. Whenever elk populations start to decline in Idaho, um, it's very common for hunters to tell us individually and as a group that the wolves ate them all. Which is frustrating because of course wolves do eat elk and that, that happens, um, but of course people eat elk too. And last year in Idaho, state uh, tag holders killed over 21,000 elk. I looked it up for Colorado, that number last year was 43,000 elk. So um, that's important context, but politics make it really difficult for, um, for state, well, Idaho Fish and Game certainly, to um, speak up and correct policymakers and hunters when they make those sorts of comments. So sometimes the tribe had to be the one to do that. Skip down to my last one because I'm getting a red flag here. Um, I think a lot of this ultimately, from the tribe standpoint, boils down to uh, responsibility and sharing. How much do we, as a diverse society, how much are we prepared to share with wolves? We know that some people are coming at this from a very doministic or utilitarian point of view, um, something which, ironically to me and maybe to other tribes, has um, been labeled as the traditionalist view. Um, that is, it's, that is not, in general, the viewpoint, the traditional viewpoint of the Nez Perce tribe. Um, from the tribal viewpoint, um, it's not about me and what I can get from the land. It's about um, being answerable to the land, and it's about stewardship. And it's about speaking for those who cannot speak in the tribe's more, more religious um, standpoint. And in that worldview, a, a landscape without wolves is like a landscape without bears or uh, wildfire or, or winter, right? Those things are all damaging at times, they can be. They're all management challenges, certainly. But those things all belong on the landscape. They make the landscape complete from the tribe's standpoint. Um, we found that there's plenty of room for wolves in Idaho. We just have to remember and be willing to accept that these landscapes have always been risky and dynamic. And we have to be prepared to share these landscapes with those who came before us. So, Ketsi, y'all thank you very much. Appreciate it.